Hello and welcome to the Swine Disease Reporting System. This is the report number 42. My name is Edison Magalhães here at Iowa State University. Hello, my name is Giovanni Trevisan here at Iowa State University. Hello, Daniel Linhares also at Iowa State. And today, as usual, we're going to cover the findings for the SDRS in the month of July in this report number 42. So basically, we have three pages, one page for, for PCR detection uh, in different pathogens. So first page, uh, PCR detection on PERS, then uh, enteric coronavirus, and then mycoplasma. And the last page, the disease diagnosed that uh, information from the ISU VDL. And today we, we wanted to focus more and discuss, dig deeper uh, into PERS. We, know, we all know that PERS is, is a hot topic in the industry. And more recently, we had the, the increased detection on the PERS 144, specifically the lineage 1C. And we wanted to discuss here today with Daniel. Daniel has a, a lot of, of expertise and background. Also, his PhD, he worked a lot on, on, on that uh, area. And we wanted to have the discussion here. And also, Daniel was, uh, he's the founder of the, the SDRS with Giovanni. So they had this, this idea. And Daniel, tell us about uh, what was the idea behind uh, the motivations to pursue the, 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 and develop the SDRS. And also, how that how can uh, swine practitioners use information, for example, of the MSHIMP and the SDRS together? How that they can use that uh, collectively? Well, so the the MSHIMP or the Morrison Swine Health Monitoring Program is, of course, a great program program that benchmarks purse incidents and changes in purse virus status in breeding sow farms or participating systems. There was a great vision from. Bob Morrison to establish that program and now the program has been uh, recently expanded and improved under Cesar Corso's leadership, right? Mm -hmm. And so how about the SDRS, the Swine Disease Reporting System, thinking that uh, there are tons of tests uh, done at the, done at the v veterinary diagnostic labs. Uh, Giovanni, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we are over a million, t a million cases now yep. with... Uh, more than 7 million samples, right, being tested by just PCR uh, tests in those VDLs. And so a lot of data there. And so we thought, uh, how, how can we use that data? How can we turn that data into information to help people understand macroepidemiology, macroepidemiology of pathogens affecting the swine industry? So if you understand the patterns of disease activity and uh, uh, o over time, region, age, group, etc., you have now the opportunity to influence, right? Because you know the, the, the pattern. And uh, f the, the PERS example, Giovanni has uh, uh, s several papers describing this now, that uh, in some regions there is this, this cyclic pattern of detection waves, right, that goes up in the uh, fall, winter, uh, d down in, uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in summer and in, in spring. And so everybody knows that. Everybody knows about that cyclic pattern. It's a no-brainer. But now you know exactly the purse activity. You know exactly which week, which age group, which state. And so giving giving people uh, a, a heads up of what's co coming in terms of uh, increased activity or, or detection level. Oh, great for you. Thanks for your comments. So let's get started. Today we're going to change a little bit how we conduct the, the discussion because, like I said, we're going to discuss a lot on PERS. So first, let's, let's just uh, give a brief uh, summary of what was the detection, the patterns in terms of for the other pathogens and disease diagnosis. So Giovanni, could you give us the, the information on, on, on those pathogens? Of course, and as you say, we are changing a little bit the script here. So in terms of enteric coronavirus PCR detection, <coughs> We are seeing a lowering in terms of detection following the lowest levels for, as expected for this time of the year. No TG detection during July. Mm -hmm. When we look for mycoplasma hyomone, the number of cases tested is not going up, but the percentage of positive cases is going up more at the end of month of July. Additionally to that, when we look for disease diagnosed at Iowa State University, we also pick some signals on the monitoring uh, algorithms for an increase in the number of diagnoses for these agents. A little bit different from previous years is that it is happening 
one or two e weeks before what was observed prior. Mm -hmm. When we are talking about disease diagnosis, we need we saw some signals also for E. coli and Salmonella during June and beginning of July. So that is more case for these agents that has been diagnosed. And going back for our first page, PERS virus, finally we can mention that PERS virus is having a decrease in detection, is following the expected trend for this year, and that's most contributed for a lowering in detection in the winter market age category. We cannot forget that everybody talks right now about this emergent PERS virus strain, the 144L1C variant, And to help with that and monitor this epidemiological curve of detection, we have included in the report this chart now. The advisory group reminds us that it's very important that the industry keep organizing together for this, understanding what's the trend of detection, what's working, and share those informations to help him prevent further outbreaks with this strain. Additionally to that, some analysis that we did for this recent wave that we created at the end of April, May, and June of 2021, we have observed that a group of strains, now it's showing PERS virus nucleotide identity between 97 and 98% similar to the strains that broke in October of that year, of last year, of 2020. Mm -hmm. So the PERS virus keep moving, keep a genetic diversifying and evolving over time. No, Giovanni, thanks. So, Daniel, do you think that there is a trend or the, the industry as a whole uh, is kind of shifting and, and focusing more on the growing pig side? Also, they, they, they still focus on, on the salt farm, but also do you see more awareness and, and people focusing on, on the, this, the, this age category? I think so, Edison. Like you said, I think uh, people have been doing great progress in salt farms as they, they should, right? They should continue focusing on salt farms. But on top of that, We know more based on on the on this data here that Giovanni is talking about from the SDRS, as well as from the data from other uh, uh, field studies that we've done, sampling over 200 sites over time, right from win to finish. It's mm -hmm. it's obvious uh, how much virus those uh, those sites uh, have, so they play a, a very significant role, and I think people should, uh, like you said, keep focusing on the south farm, but at the same time. Uh, uh, keep keep uh, improving efforts there on monitoring, prevention, and uh, and control of virus in the grow finish side. Mm -hmm. No thanks. And you have done like uh, an excellent job on on, on your PhD uh, thesis on the time to stability and time to baseline production. Uh, what would you expect? From, from that from that result uh, for the current monitoring protocol that we have nowadays, the more populational samples. And also, could you give us your, your thoughts on, on the cost of an outbreak on the, nowadays? Yeah, so first part of, of the question is, uh, I, I think we, we hear from a lot of uh, veterinarians and producers this concern that the virus is persisting longer, right, in the population. Mm -hmm. And I think there are at least two lines of thoughts. One is, is it persisting longer because the virus has changed? That's one. Or does it persist longer because actually now we have better surveillance tools, right? Population-based uh, surveillance, for example, pro using processing fluids on a weekly basis as opposed to bleeding pigs once a month or so, uh, right? If you're uh, uh, bleeding or sampling more frequently uh, and more intensively, you're going to find the virus uh, easier. So I think uh, bo both of, uh, I think those two theories are, I think they, they both make sense to me. If we look at the virus, the, has the virus changed or not? Uh, Giovanni has reported, uh, I think it's, it, it, it's, uh, it's peer-reviewed now, um, information on families of virus, you name it, 184, 174, 144, those all changed over the years. And over space, right, mm -hmm. Jovan? So the same virus strain over time and space, they change uh, significantly. So it's not the same virus. They, they have changed, they evolved, they continue to do so. And so 
in the second part it's the, it's the same it's a, the second in this in the second theory we following a number of farms over time after herd, a herd closure it's not rare to find a virus in some rooms but not in others or intermittent detection over o- over time as well i find this week not in the following or sometimes i have six, seven, eight weeks of negative tests followed by a positive one, which demonstrate that the virus has ability to sustain infection at a very low prevalence. So uh, I think, think thinking about uh, uh, monitoring cell farms, it's, uh, it's, pr- it's, it's important to, to keep in mind that the, the virus change, yes, but also keep in mind that got a got sample repeatedly over time and, uh, and space. You talked about time to baseline production too, defined as time it takes for a farm to recover productivity right after the outbreak. And uh, something that we've observed over the years is that time to baseline productivity and time to stability, right, those go in opposite directions. So the quicker the farm uh, uh, takes to win negative pigs, uh, the longer it takes to re- recover productivity. In, in general, in average, there are exceptions, but uh, we think that uh, the higher the virulence of the virus, the f- quicker it spreads, the higher production impact it, it makes, but at the same time, as it's spreading faster, it takes a, a quick, uh, relatively, in average, uh, sooner to, um, to recover from the, out- for, uh, from the outbreak in terms of... Uh, um, per status at winning by PCR. Mm-hmm. Daniel, this is a great subject when you talk about time and stability in baseline production. If I remember correct, on your 2014 study about this uh, association, there was this newly emerging uh, RFLP 174 lineage 1A that was included mm-hmm. in your study. And now... At 2020, there is this information about this new uh, PERS 144 lineage on C variant strain. What are the similarities or differences that you see when you compare these two uh, strains in terms of time to baseline and time to stability? So those were two similar strains in the sense that they were emerging at their respective time, right? 174 kind of changed a, a bit and re-emerged in 2014, as you said. And, and this 144 of lineage 1C, the variant one emerging now at the end of uh, 2020, right? And so those were two relatively new, and so with a very high uh, intense production impact, and, uh, and so uh, uh, killing not, not only pigs in the grow finish, but, but also in south farms ca- causing some production problems. But the... G- The, the good news on both of those is that we've, we've seen that over time, uh, the herds that kept breaking with those, they, they, they tend to herd, herd immunity uh, seem to uh, kick in. And then it's not that the virus is not virulent anymore, but it's not more virulent than, than other contemporary mm-hmm. strains. With that 174, for example, at that time, Bob... Morrison and I worked with the uh, Iowa Select folks. We, we presented the, the, fa- the, the, those results at uh, the Lemon Conference at, at that time, and we demonstrated that the uh, farms infected with 144, they had a win to finish mortality, uh, higher win to finish mortality, lower average daily gain. At the end of the day, the, the production impact was of, uh, I think it was $2.80 higher or more. In, in addition, right, to, to other contemporary strains. That was in 2014, 15. And then a, a year later, we updated the study with more closeouts. And guess what? There was no difference of 174 compared to other strains. So as time goes by, herd immunity kicks in. And then those viruses, relatively, they, they, they are not uh, more virulent than other kind of uh, contemporary Wild type viruses. Finger crosses for the 144. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so But Giovanni, so sorry, so, so just a follow up on, on Giovanni here. We tend to, to talk about this strain or that strain. Mm-hmm. And uh, when we talk about that, we're typically referring to a consensus strain or the most prevalent strain in the herd. And now Giovanni doing 
a lot of studies here with uh, whole genome sequencing in cell farms, and that's not that's not the case, right, Giovanni? It's not it's 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 not that it's an exception. The rule is there are multiple strains going on. That's correct, Daniel. When you look the, for the consensus strain, you target that the other five region of the genome, and you tend to repeat that and get that same strain back in the results. But when you start to apply whole genome sequence and you look for the full genome, you have more opportunity to compare diff and pick up different mm -hmm. strains in the testing. So it's not uncommon to see a lot of different strains circulate in the farm, and if you start to look for them, you're going to see that and find those. So finally, we have something that we could move from the anecdotal perception that you have more than a strain to a way that you can explore that by testing, doing whole genome sequence, and visualizing the presence of multiple strains circulating the farm. Mm -hmm. And more than 50% of the farms that did enroll in this study had the detection of more than one wild, wild type strain circulating the farm. Oh, great discussion. And Daniel, just a follow-up on, on, we know that PERS-144 is a, is a, is a new topic in, in, in related to PERS, but we always have different information, and we discussed uh, previously the growing pig side. Uh, for the, specifically for that age category, uh, there are so many things that we have to take in, into account when we have an outbreak and, and the strategies that a company needs to implement. So my first question will be, what will be like the, the, the impact of a, out, a let, lateral, lateral introduction on a, on, a, on a growing pig? And also if the system, the second question is that if the system has to have like a, a sort of a decision tree for different scenarios for those growing pigs. Because we discussed a lot of things that, that change over time in related to virulence and, and the, the region. So would like to pick your brain on, on that. A million dollar question isn't it that it's on <laughs> I like we like this concept of decision trees right because there there are the extremes if you think about I have a, a a naive pig coming to a very high dense area think about Iowa they're likely gonna get exposed the question is wh why not vaccinate some sort of immunization you're gonna likely do with th those pigs on the other extreme you send pigs to a remote areas pigs that are clean why would you vaccinate those? Why, why, if if the chance of infection is pretty low? So those are the extremes. But we know that in reality there is a lot of middle middle ground, right? Uh, there's some level of immunity, some risk. It's not uh, neither zero or or one hundred percent. So a lot of questions between number of doses, frequency of those, in concentration of those, and we think that each production system and only the, the, that production system will, will have those answers based on their uh, data sets and the interaction of what, what's going on with their systems, right, in terms of co-infections, in terms of uh, pig flow, in terms of uh, commingling as snow and, and uh, those sorts of interactions that we, we know that makes a difference in terms of, uh, of uh, a, a effect of a disease or response of an intervention to that pathogen infection, right? And you also mentioned previously the biocontainment concept, right? People are implementing more of this in, the, in their system or thinking about this with giving more value for this, especially, for example, with the salt farms, preventing their salt farms from an introduction, from coming from a growing pig mm -hmm. site. And, and on this discussion about growing pig sites being kind of reservoirs of pearls, virus, what do you think the, are the implications of that and what people can do to fix these factors on the mm -hmm. perception that growing pigs are serving as a reservoir of PERS virus. Yeah, I think it's a fact, right? The numbers demonstrate how important those uh, growing pig sites, site populations, uh, they're, right, they're really keeping the virus alive, so important for virus ecology. And so what are the implications? I think there are two, at least, right? The risk, the south farm risk, the more virus you have in the growth finished population, and then with the number of epidemiological connections, you think about feed delivery, you think about people, you think about uh, pig, pig delivery, pig delivery, other supplies. So a lot of connections between the growth finish and the south farms. So the more virus you have in the region, the more uh, risk the south farms have to to outbreak. 
and Edison was talking about cost of a uh, outbreak. I think it's really variable, but the number that we see people use, it's still $250 to $300 per sow thinking about an outbreak. So that's one implication. And mm-hmm. the other implication is growth, uh, growth finish uh, health, right? I mean, w- we know from different studies, experimental and observational, that uh, pigs that the earlier they get infected and the more diversity of virus that they get exposed to, wild type virus that they get exposed to, uh, the worse they perform. And that's also a fact. So if you can reduce the pressure of infection in the growth finish pigs, you decrease the the risk for south farms and you improve productivity in growth finish. Great. And now you asked what can people do about it, right? And we, we've I think it's uh, also a couple of different things. First, gotta lower the prevalence, right? It's the obvious answer. You wanna mm-hmm. decrease yeah. Uh, activity, you gotta you gotta lower the prev the prevalence or the pressure of infection. And now we are talking about bio exclusion and bio management and bio immuno immuno management, right? So immune talking about the immunizing those incoming pigs and showering in and uh, other basic kind of bio bio exclusion uh, management. And the second thing is decrease the the chance of, of uh, spill spillover from the growth finish back to other growth finish or back to the south farm. And now we're talking about biocontainment, right? Uh, and, uh, and so things like shower, showering out and, and uh, n- testing those pigs to understand uh, if they are infectious or not, the population is infectious or not, so that you can make uh, your, your health pyramid based decisions on people and pig and pig flow. So, uh, at the end of the day, what can you do? Biosecurity, biocontainment, and uh, inform decisions based on, on virus activity. And how do you decide about testing? How much money can you put on that? Yeah, that's another great question, right? And if we, So if we do a quick exercise, let's say I have 100 sites, grow finish sites, each with, uh, say, 3,000 uh, 3, pigs, right? So... How much does it cost for me to monitor those pigs throughout mm-hmm. going mm-hmm. to finish? If you if you take advantage of um, oral fluids, oral fluid testing, really easy, practical, can and uh, and have uh, six time points from win to finish, sample them every now and then, uh, pull those tests. You, uh, if you consider thirty dollars per. Sub- submission, right, uh, including the PCR and some submission costs. You were talking about some 18,000 18, per uh, those 100 sites or about $0.06 cents per per pig. Mm-hmm. And now what's the payoff? That's the cost or what's, uh, what's the payback, right? How do, I, how do I justify that investment? Well, if I, based on those tests... I identify where the virus is, where the virus is not. So with that, uh, I, I can make uh, my health pyramid, truck flow, people flow, people management, veterinary visits, all that. Uh, is if uh, with that I can prevent three sites from being infected, considering two two dollars per per pig um, as the cost of a, a, a per infection in that age group. Uh, to be conservative, I think. That's your eighteen thousand dollars right there. So mm-hmm. uh, six cents per pig. You pay mm-hmm. that in if if you prevent three uh, out, outbreaks in grow finish sites, right? And of course, the more you prevent, the now now it's all return of, uh, over over that initial investment. It's not only testing; it's by testing and use that that data to generate information for health decisions. Yeah, it goes back to Edison's <laughs> decision trees, right? What am I gonna do? Well, it depends. It depends on the region. It depends on the on the on the test results. It depends on availability of resources, trucking, logistics, all that. But if you have that information now, you can incorporate that into your decision making. It's not a guess anymore. Well, thanks, Daniel. Great discussion. I think uh, was really good. And to wrap up, uh, taking into account everything that we discussed it here, there's a lot to learn. There's a, st- a lot that we are learning now. So, in your opinion, uh, what will be like the, the future or, or of disease diagnostic and surveillance in the 
in the swine industry, taking into account everything that we discussed here today? Uh, Edison, I, I'm, I'm pretty excited on, on, that, on that question. I think we're just starting as the swine industry. Mm -hmm. We, uh, uh, Charles uh, Schwab from Davis, he talked about this concept of ongoing on-farm health surveillance for precision swine health uh, and productivity management mm -hmm. back in the 50s, 60s. And now we are, I think we're living that as we speak, as people investing in, in uh, ongoing farm, ongoing uh, re, uh, re, field, field research, right, mm -hmm. and making decisions based on, uh, on, on what's out there and their particular flows. I, I believe that we, don't, we can't manage what you don't measure, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and uh, we, we are measuring more frequently, doing more uh, surveillance more frequently and more, efficient, more efficiently, more accurate, accurately with this, those population-based sampling. So now we understand more about disease uh, spread, disease ecology in population, mm -hmm. and what can we do with that? While we have that knowledge, now you, you have the option to intervene based, mm -hmm. based on data. And that's important because as the swine industry keeps expanding and consolidating with bigger farms, bigger barns, fewer uh, decision makers on the table making decisions to uh, hundreds of sites, each with hundreds of pigs, the cost of being wrong is pretty, pretty high and mm -hmm. going up. Mm -hmm. So the math adds quickly. Each decision is a multi-million dollar decision. And how many of those can you afford to be wrong, right? Not... Not, not many. So again, the, what's the future of surveillance? I think that's a very important concept for rapid uh, detection, rapid response for precision, li pre precision swine health uh, in production ma uh, management. So uh, we can see going forward production system specific SDRS like programs where you integrate data from the lab, data from productivity, data from biosecurity and that of a cost and benefit of different interventions so people could make those uh, data-driven decisions. And again, the cost of being wrong is, is, is high and going up. Mm -hmm. So you can't afford to be, to be wrong many times. And you have the data there, right? Right. Make the data work for you, right? Transform <laughs> the data into information and, and use it. Yeah, no, thank you very much. I think it was a really good discussion. And that was it for this, for this month report. And I hope to see you guys soon. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks, Giovanni. Thank, thank you, you, guys. Thank you.